Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Meet an artist in Rochester with a unique vision for her sculptures. Learn about a business that has been family owned for over a century in Stuartville. Visit a museum in St. Louis Park dedicated to the history of broadcasting in Minnesota. And peruse a distinctive collection in Owatonna. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Nicole Havkost is an artist living in Rochester. She creates both two-dimensional and three-dimensional media. She has taken a particular interest in sewing dolls. In the creation of her sewing dolls, Nicole hopes to come closer to understanding the relationship people have with their own bodies. dolls that I've been making are really representations of me or almost self-portraits. I'm Nikki Havkost and I'm an artist. I live in Rochester, Minnesota. And over the last couple years, um, my work has been primarily figurative. I've made figures for probably 20 years. Started in graduate school. Um, prior to that, I had always made um, exterior to clothing, so I made these dresses that sort of stood up like dolls, um, but didn't have heads and didn't have arms and limbs, and but they had personalities, and at some point in grad school, um, it just was time to start dealing with the body to like figure out what it needed to look like. So since then, I've sort of just been trying to figure out, that's a way to figure out my body is through these other bodies. For many years I've wanted to make dolls that had found objects included in them and I didn't know how to do it because most of my dolls were cloth. And a friend showed me this material called paper clay and it just worked perfectly to cover portions of the found objects and make them look seamless as a part of the whole limb or the whole body. I started with the sewing found objects because I was interested in being able to repair oneself. And those are tools that I learned to use as a girl and in college as a way to you know, fix fabrics and fix clothing. And, and so I think it just works really well as a metaphor for fixing oneself. My dolls, they're all attached by hook and eye, so I like that they are communal, they can be shared between dolls, so if you don't have the right tool to fix whatever's necessary, you can switch out whatever you have for something else. Some of the tools take things apart and some of the tools put things together. And just sort of a, a way to deal with one's body and one's self and not have to have it be perfect, like it can be in process. The dolls right now sort of walk this line that there is some peace in them, there is some acceptance in them, but there also is some room for adjusting and making changes or making repairs. When I have experienced sort of creative blocks in my work, I tend to bake a lot. <laughs> and so I think the cooking tools um, really reference a kind of nourishment for oneself or nurturing for oneself. People have very specific ideas about dolls based on their experience with dolls. There's a whole world of sort of sweet and twee kind of dolls, and then there's dolls that kind of go into creepy. And I think with my dolls, they start to take on this kind of creepy or difficult um, connotation. And I think that for me, personally, dolls are really about my own mortality. And I find that when people have a really strong reaction to a doll or to a piece of work, it's because they're experiencing something they're not ready to experience. 
and I think it's easier to just write it off, you know, if the doll is creepy or if it's weird to just say it's this other because they don't want to go further into that experience. With my work, especially showing dolls the last time at the Rochester Art Center, I often had people come up to me and say, oh, this one reminds me of this thing I had. You know, I've been at Mayo all year because I, you know, I have something wrong with my digestion or I have something wrong with this or that and I'm getting poked and prodded and this one really feels like how it feels to be me right now. And I love that everybody can bring their own personal experience. I have my idea of what the doll meant to me when I made it. Um, but then everybody has their own personal experience that they can lay on top of it so that it becomes them as well. So I like that dolls have this sort of universal quality in that they are us and it's whatever part of us we bring to them. So for Nikki's exhibition, it was basically two types of work, all living kind of in the same universe, but it was all doll-based work. She did dolls that were kind of fictional animal characters, like this fantasy kind of playful thing. And then the other work kind of hit me a little deeper. It was like a little more serious. That was the work that kind of um, pertained to Nikki's interest in body image and spoke to her being a woman artist. And I think um, it was kind of a strange mix of both of those ideas, but at the same time, you could kind of see Nikki in all of that work. And I think that was really exciting. And then there's also an element of the exhibition that was parts of these dolls, which takes you to a whole different place. That's where people could maybe get a little bit, um, come away with a little bit more grotesque kind of ideas of what they're looking at. But you know, because for example, you're looking at this, this doll and it's, you know, it's put together, it's composed, it's whole. That's one thing. But then you look on the wall and then all of a sudden you see disembodied parts of a doll. And the fact that Nikki's a woman making work about women's bodies kind of being taken apart um, you know, there's some deeper issues there that she's kind of thinking about and working with, and sometimes that kind of um, gets people a little uncomfortable, and that's okay. I think that art is important because we all have so many different experiences and so many different viewpoints, and everybody can bring their own experience to work. So, you know, it's an individual's um, process and it's an individual's outcome, um, but at the same time it can have this sort of universal effect. <laughs> I think personally for me, I'm the better version of myself when I'm making work and I just need to be making, it doesn't matter whether it's good or, or bad, um, that it, that it nourishes me in a way that makes me easier to be around and better for other people. I just love that Minnesota makes it a priority to make the arts available um, to both people that want to see it and to make um, funds available to artists so that they can have the means to do the work they want to do. When a business reaches the age of 100, it's a reason to celebrate. That's just what the owners of the Griffin Gray Funeral Home in Stewartville did. The business has been in the same family since it started back in 1914. We talked to the owners about the longevity of the company. It isn't unthinkable that as, as if Sturt will continue to grow, we might end up having more than one funeral home. But right now, we've filled that need for this community for 100 years. The Griffin Gray Funeral Home has been in the same family for 100 years. My brothers and sisters and I all agreed that we needed to celebrate the fact that this business has been serving this community for that long. I think the, the community probably liked the idea that we were making a big deal over it and also that these two had been doing it for as long as they have. You know, we needed to recognize their commitment to, 
taking care of families for three and four generations. This 100th anniversary is a little bit unusual in the fact that it's only three generations involved. My father-in-law, my Jerry's dad, he took over the business in 1914, and I came along and he hired me in uh, 1949. This house was built originally in 1888, so it's older than 100 years. There's only been three owners of this property. W.E. Smith, my father-in-law, Pat Griffin, and till this day, my wife and I, Jerry and I. So there's a lot of history in this house. My dad uh, was born on a farm at Simpson, Minnesota, five miles from here. My dad went to St. Paul. I guess that's when he decided maybe he would be interested in this business. And he also graduated then from the University of Minnesota Mortuary School. And um, he came to Stewartville and worked um, with John Towie, who had the funeral home and furniture business at that time. And within a couple years, Mr. Towie decided to sell his business, and my dad and a man, Mr. Roman, um, bought the business. Mr. Roman was with uh, my dad in that business for, I think, three years, something like that. And then my dad took it over, and it was in 1914. After uh, college, after graduation, I served my apprenticeship here with my father-in-law, Pat. And I've been here ever since. Traveled around a little bit, had worked in different industries. I worked at Mayo Clinic for a while. I worked for Bachman Floral Shop in Rochester. I didn't really want to go into the family business. Remember, this is the 60s and 70s, and you kind of wanted to do your own thing. In my late 20s, that's when I decided to come back to Minnesota, go to school, get my degree. And as I started that school, I was pretty much helping my dad in, the, in every funeral as much as I could. Time out, guys. Griffin Funeral Home. And it used to be in the, back in the day before answering machines or cell phones or pagers. You know, you were married to the phone. You could not walk away from it. We've been a part of the community, both uh, civically, business-wise, and um, we operate our business in a proper, in a, what's the word I'm looking for, Jerry? A professional and fair way. Fair. Honestly, Friendly. you know, we, we don't just do funerals in Stuartville. We've had funerals in St. Paul, we've had funerals in Sioux City, Iowa. We go to Rochester occasionally because people that live in Stuartville go to church there and they want to have their funerals in their church. Um, so the fact that we've been in business as many years as we have, we've served a lot of families. I mean, my grandfather worked probably well past 65. My dad is considering retiring. He's only 89, so there's no rush. So he's worked 60 some years. So that's why we've been able to do it in just three generations, if you think about it, Dad. You know, and I've, I, I like to say I've worked, I've been working in this family business for about 30 years, which is, that's nothing. That's. That's just getting started in comparison to these other two. <laughs> One of the ladies that I visited with during the uh, open house uh, said to me, you know, we counted the other day and we've had, you've had 33 funerals with our family. Just one family. One, fa one lady said that. Somebody asked me, how many funerals <laughs> have you done? You know, total. And just, we don't know. You know, we've never tried to get up get that number substantiated, but it's been a long time.
Minnesota has a rich history in broadcasting. The Pavic Museum of Broadcasting in St. Louis Park presents and preserves that history. The museum strives to show how pioneers in electronic communications created an enormous impact on the evolution of our society. We took a tour of the Pavic Museum of Broadcasting to learn more. The Pavic Museum is more than just broadcasting. On the outside it looks quite small, it looks like you know, an old warehouse, and then you come in and there's this giant room and it has thousands of objects that really represent the broadcasting history of America. It's a very funky retro, kind of has its own personality to it. We have radios, TVs, TV shows people watch as kids, musical instruments. We have a ham radio studio which is functioning for any ham amateur enthusiasts. Basically anything that's so specific to radios, TVs, broadcasting, we have. The Pavic Museum began with Joe Pavic and his passion for old radios. Joe was actually teaching at Dunwoody and the students were tearing apart old radios to learn how to fix them. And it bothered him to, to see these beautiful radios torn apart. He took one home well, the next thing you know, he was a radio collector. When he started his business, he covered a five-state area wholesaling nuts and bolts, and it gave him something to do after he called on his one or two customers in a small town. He would hit the antique stores, he would hit the trade schools, and at that point, the collection got out of hand. Earl Bakken was the inventor of the implantable pacemaker and the founder of Medtronic. Earl had put himself through college fixing old radios, televisions. He knew about the Pavic collection. He'd visited it. When Joe decided to auction the collection off, Earl did everything in his power to, to keep it here in Minnesota. So Earl got together with the Minnesota Broadcasters Association and they formed the nonprofit umbrella for the museum. Jack Mullen was Bing Crosby's audio engineer. When he retired, he had put this big collection together that documents the history of recorded sound. Jack started looking for a museum that could purchase it, and Earl purchased the Mullen collection for this museum. We have one of the two machines that was used to record the 47-48 season of Bing Crosby show, and it really is the first tape recorder used in the entertainment industry in the Western world. Once we got the museum established, Earl came to us and he said, you've got to do something with these radios. It's not enough just to have them preserved and have people looking at them. We need educational programs for children. The broadcast workshop is our most popular workshop. It started in 1991. We give them a brief presentation of electricity and electronic communication. And then afterwards, the kids get to go do a radio show in our 1960s radio studio. And then after that, they go do a game show where they get to be asked questions about what they learned at the presentation at the beginning. Their radio shows do broadcast within two block radius, so not very much, but they still get really excited about it. So it kind of gets them interested about, you know, why we have electricity, where we get, you know, the internet or our telephones or how this all came about. They're becoming part of it, and hopefully we're creating memories for them. We can read about this stuff, but until you actually get near enough to touch it and feel it and, and hear it and see it, they just don't know what it is. To have tourism with seniors and elderly people, they can add their stories and their memories let you know that their grandpa had that or that you know, this was the first thing that they listened to you know, a certain commercial on. I saw a lot of things here that I totally forgot about over the years. The floor model uh, shortwave and AM radios reminds me back of my grandmother. I sit in an easy chair in her living room, looking at that big green eye in the middle listening to our favorite radio shows, Amos and Andy, Spike Jones and the City Slickers, all those old shows we sit and listen to. For the most part, people are a little ambivalent and then they start to see things that they can relate to and they start to realize that we care about their experience as much as we care about the stuff. 
and then they really start to have fun. They brought out this replica of the Edison cylinder, and then we went to a real cylinder, and I've seen him, but I've never heard him, and he played a cylinder. I thought that was fantastic. That's something you don't normally see, and that's history. Linda Jacobson collects chairs, but not just any kind. These chairs are from early to mid-century designers. She picked up the chairs in her collection based on the esteem of their creators. Recently, Linda's collection was on display at the Owatonna Arts Center. We went to the center to take a look. Animals lie on the ground. People elevate themselves up off the ground. It's the difference between animals and humans. A chair is a really distinguishing factor. My name is Linda Jacobson and I am a retired school teacher. I taught art and I have been collecting chairs for over 55 years. It would be hard for me to explain my fascination with chairs. I can only tell you that I have had this since I was about 10 years old. When I really became enamored with my first chair, and that chair belonged to a woman who lived across the school playground. And I would see that chair every day when we played as children at the school playground. I finally talked my mom into coming with me to see this lady who owned the chair and ask if she would consider selling me the chair, which she was reluctant to do in the beginning, but after researching a little bit, she did find a hanging clothespin bag and decided that because that chair was her clothespin bag holder, that she could relinquish it now that she had found something to substitute for the chair. And that became my first chair acquisition. It was the ice cream parlor chair um, that is right over here. It has the curlicue back and it's a very common chair. It's not that precious at all. It's probably the least of all the chairs that I have in my collection, but in fact it was the beginning, so I keep it. I've taken it from place to place for 60 years, I guess more. <laughs> People know I am interested in chairs and they'll call me and they'll say, Linda, there's a chair down at the antique shop. It looks like one of yours. And so if it's you know, a reasonable buy, I buy it. I found one of my chairs in the ditch. My sister and I were on a trip and I slammed on the brakes and I said, Joyce, did you see that? And she said, yes. I said, I think it's a swan chair. And we backed up and it was. So there's no place too humble for me to find a chair. If it's the right pedigree, which sounds snooty, but it needs to have the right manufacturer, then I'm interested in that chair. Perhaps I have, oh, somewhere in the range of 60 collectible chairs. Many times I have duplicates of a chair. Chairs in pairs are sort of a nice object because you can set them next to each other and so on. Or oftentimes chairs are sold in pairs. I think that the design of chairs are sort of a living history of design. I mean, the, the moving from chairs which were very laboriously done by hand and put together, and then they 
evolved into something that could be taken apart completely and flat packed so they could ship them overseas in, you know, slow ships back in the 1800s. And that was kind of the beginning of flat pack furniture. And then the tubular steel ideas, that was a really new concept. And so what the chairs reveal really is a kind of a moving history of how design has evolved in maybe in more things other than just furniture. sort of an object of desire. I don't go out necessarily and just buy it because you, you know, typically you can find these things new. But when you are a collector, you're always looking for something that, you know, is in the least probable place. And that is certainly how I have acquired a lot of my chairs. That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.